Glass is an alchemic blend of sand and metallic oxides combined with extraordinary blinding heat. The result is a material that flows and drips like honey. When it's hot, glass is alive. It moves gracefully and inexorably in response to gravity and centripetal force. It possesses an inner light and transcendent radiant heat that make it simultaneously one of the most fascinating and one of the most frustrating and technically challenging materials for an artist to work with. The glass itself is unforgiving, and the glass gods are all-seeing and utterly malevolent. <laughs> One single misstep in the mixing or the melting or the making or even the cooling of glass results in shattered glass and failure. I was looking for the largest building I could possibly find for the least amount of money when I bought this farm in Western Massachusetts in 1976. I took it as a good omen when I found several handmade marbles outside the kitchen window. And when I brought them inside and washed them off, they were just as bright and fascinating as they were the sunny summer afternoon they went missing maybe 70 years before when kids were called in for supper. The first visitor that I ever had to my studio was a school teacher. And when I told her what I did for a living, she asked me if I would be willing to demonstrate glass blowing to all the eighth graders in the county. And I readily agreed, not realizing that that decision would take me and my work flying in a totally new direction. Glass. Glass furnaces are kind of like farm animals. They need to be looked after and tended to both day and night, month after month, year after year. Walking back and forth between my studio and my, my house, I couldn't help but be amazed by dawn and the night sky, uh, thunderstorms down the valley, and auroras, and all the other natural and celestial phenomenon that I would, that just surrounded me. And it's not really amazing that all of that came out and started to come out in my work. What I didn't realize was that there were zillions of eighth graders in the county and that I'd inadvertently agreed to give a demonstration every Wednesday afternoon for months and months. And oh, this is my furnace, this is my studio at night. It looks kind of medieval, but in fact, my studio is a modern maker space for glass that with history and roots that go back at least 2,000 or more years. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever known an eighth grader. These are people who will suffer no boredom whatsoever in their lives. <laughs> they were not the slightest bit interested in me making uh, vases or bowls or bottles. I thought about the marbles that I'd found outside my house, and I began to make cat's eyes and swirly marbles and things like that for them, and they seemed to like that. But one night, I was thinking about this photograph, and I was thinking about Neil Armstrong. And when Neil... Neil observed, he said, I put up my thumb and shut one eye, and my thumb blotted out the planet Earth. I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. And of course, if you get the right distance and the right perspective, our world, which seems so limitless, is just a little blue marble floating in the black void of space. So the next day, instead of making marbles for these kids, I began to make planets for them. Planets are just a simple sphere, but they're visually compelling, and they give me a chance to use every conceivable glass uh, technique that I've ever learned. And I found that they manage to transcend age and gender and culture and language and religion and sometimes even time. Now, 
in the past 40 or 50 years, my planets have taken me all, well, they've traveled all over the world, and I've gotten to go with them on occasion, in this case to Saudi Arabia, and my work in Kuwait. I even got to meet the Pope, and I was really worried when he reached out his hand to shake my hand. I thought my own hand might start to burn and shrivel, <laughs> proving, proving once and for all that everything that my mother said about me when I was a kid was true. <laughs> I'm not sure what has held my attention about, about glass uh, for the last nearly 50 years. I know it's not just the chemistry or the color or the heat or the complexity of it. I think sometimes it's just the sheer challenge to make anything at all out of a 2,000 degree unruly and uncooperative liquid. It's just this amazing material. So I've been committed since I started to blow glass to making every single piece, every single piece that leaves my studio is something I've made myself, often and always with the help of my assistants. I'm gonna show you how I make a mega world. I begin by spending sometimes weeks or months making the little tiny pieces that go inside. And just as our world started out as a molten mass, mind you too, I begin by taking a small little gather on the end of my blowpipe gathering up layer after layer after that to first make an inner world that you might not see if you're looking at it from the outside unless you turn it over. Each succeeding layer I do something else to. In this case, I'm putting continents on. And I'll get it hot, and I'll add little tiny fragments of glass that are made ahead of time. Some of them are quite complicated, and they become walled cities or geological features, or I often put gold and silver on the planet's surface. Actually, silver accounts for all the blue colors in my work. I use a dental drill sometimes to engrave the glass and a torch to heat up little pieces of glass that can add color. It has to be reheated back and forth in the furnace over and over again in order to keep it liquid. And on each succeeding layer, it gets heavier and bigger, and it becomes really it's kind of like watching my, me and my team, I think it's kind of like watching a bunch of football players try to do ballet. <laughs> it's really exhausting. You can't stop. Once you start a piece, you have to go all the way through to the end. I warm up my gloves, pick this piece up, and I'll put it into a cooling oven that's actually at about just shy of 1,000 degrees where it'll stay for up to 16 weeks. I do make other work, and lately I've been completely enamored with making plates or discs that are meant to be my idea of what it's like to look through Hubble's lens at some distant universe, or uh, that's a Hubble photo right there, and a close-up of one of my plates. I'd like to introduce my crew of planet makers. Half of them uh, work part-time, but these are incredibly skilled people, and they are incredibly helpful, and they all absolutely are dedicated to having a good time. I also want to introduce my wife, Katie Coleman. I make planets, but Katie is an absolutely amazing explorer of planets. Out of 2,700 applicants in 1992, NASA chose three women to be astronauts, and Katie was one of them. She's made two space shuttle flights, and her third flight was aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, where she spent almost six months in space. And, of course, she brought along one of my little planets, a little planet in orbit, in zero G, in orbit around our little planet floating in the black void of the universe. Thanks.